Hey you folks, Quillington here, and welcome to another tutorial let's play of Sid Meier's Civilization V. We're playing as England over here, and we're playing on a very, very low difficulty while I try to explain every little thing that we can do. So, um, this is our, our, well it says turn one, but we actually started on turn zero. Every programmer knows zero is the first number. And so, uh, this is our second turn of the game, and we once again have to move our warrior. So, one thing I want to demonstrate is the vision here. If I move down to this cattle, you can see, we can see these jungle tiles, but we can't see on the other side. Like I was saying, it sort of blocks vision. Notably though, we can see this hill over here because you can see hills and mountains from further away. Vision system is kind of cool. Now, last turn, we actually revealed some ancient ruins over here. Ancient ruins are awesome. You wanna move units onto ancient ruins and search them right away because you will get awesome rewards from them. Well, sometimes you get mediocre rewards, but you always get something that's positive. So we're gonna keep moving in that direction. I'm gonna move down to this jungle over here. Nice and clear on the other side so we can keep seeing, oh, we've got some sugar and some bananas over here. This actually might be a really good site for a city um, somewhere over here. We're gonna figure out where we're gonna to wanna to place a second city really soon because you don't wanna just stay with one city unless you're playing a really weird kind of game. So we're gonna go ahead and skip to the next turn again. You can also skip to the next turn by hitting enter. Again, our warrior needs uh, a movement command. So I'm going to go ahead and drag all the way to the uh, the ancient ruins on this jungle hill. And let's see what we get. Oh, we explored the ruins. We found some treasures. And we received 60 gold for that. That's fantastic. You don't know what gold can be used for yet. But obviously it's a good thing. And it is. We can see our total gold up here. We currently have 66 in total. And we're earning 3 gold Per turn right now and that's because London is producing three gold per turn um, so three per turn is not much but at the start of the game that's you know pretty normal um, what you can do with gold there's a few things if we go back to London we click on London there's a few things we can do from the screen one in the bottom left corner there's the ability to purchase units and buildings so if we click that you can see the cost if we want to build say a war or buy a warrior we could spend 200 gold on it. So we can build it. We know a scout, for example, a scout currently takes us five turns to build. But if we had 140 gold, we could instantly buy a scout. That's quite cool. You can also buy buildings that way. It's a very, very handy thing. The other thing you can do, and it's really obvious down here, is buy a tile. So we're gonna talk about culture and tiles a little bit. First things first, there's a purple tile over here. What does that mean? Well, our city, hang on, let me backtrack a little bit. Over in this panel here, we can see we are producing one culture per turn. The reason we're producing one culture per turn is because our palace gives us a culture. You can also see in 13 turns, our borders will grow. So our borders is this white outline. And in 13 turns, we will grow, we will gain an extra hex, an extra tile. And the game is telling us that it's going to grab this tile over here. Sometimes more than one will be highlighted uh, because the game will sort of randomly pick from one of those. The game will, t will pick tiles that are... Um, it will prioritize resources. So right here we have stone adjacent, so it's going to grab the stone. We also have pearls and we also have silk over here. The reason it's grabbing the stone is because it's on flat land. It prefers flat land to forests and hills and also to water tiles over here. I suspect that the one it will grab after the stone will probably be these pearls over here. But we can also buy tiles right here. We can spend gold. If I click on that, I can see the cost of buying different tiles. It would cost me 50 gold to buy this stone tile. 80 to buy these tiles over here, 50 over here, 100 for this tile for some reason, 50, 100. There's a rule, there's a rhyme and a reason as to what the cost of the various tile, tile, tiles will be. It has to do with flatness and adjacency to different things and other nonsense. So um, nothing really to worry about here, but um, we're not going to buy a tile right now. There's no need for us to do that, but these are things you can spend money on. The other thing you can do with money is upgrade uh, units and do diplomacy, but that'll have to wait until a little bit later in the game. You'll note over here we are making that four science per turn, so if you get that going higher, for example, by building a library like we talked about in the last video, we can start to research technologies faster. And we'll talk about some of these other things later on, like trade and happiness and our golden age progress. And here you can start culture over here. So we use culture for two things. One, it expands the borders of our cities. So the more culture London produces, the faster it will grab more tiles. But the other thing it will do is it'll unlock social policies. So we're going to talk about that in about 13 turns when we get our first social policy. For now, we're just going to hit next turn, and we're going to explore. Now, what I'm going to do in this turn is, you remember, our warrior has two movement points. Up until now, we have moved two tiles every time. We started here, and we went one, two, then we went one, two, 
then we went one, two, so we moved two tiles every turn. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move onto this tile over here and it will consume all of our movement. And in fact, we can see that quite clearly. If I start dragging up my, um, my sort of path here, you can see it will reach here in one turn and then it will stop. Now, why is that? The reason is that there are tiles that are considered rough terrain, jungle, forest, and hills. Um, and marsh, I think, are all considered to be rough terrain, and they require two movement points to traverse. Also, crossing a river will also use up an extra movement point. So you can see here, we have not been able to move as far this turn because we moved through rough terrain. Well, that's one of the advantages to the scout. The scout ignores that extra cost. The scout always spends one movement point per tile, uh, no matter what, which is really quite good for exploration. Now I'm going to move down here it'll still just give me one movement worth of tile or one tile worth of movement but i'll be on top of the hill which will give me extra vision which is good and again i found another another ancient ruin or as we like to say in the save world a goody hut so our priority while exploring at the start of the game is one to find these goody huts two to find out what neighbors we might have and three to find good places to settle new towns now, how quickly do you want to build a, a new town? We noticed, well, now's a good time to talk about it because our scout finished, so London is prop prompting us to choose another construction progress or project. So we're going to do that. Again, once we get to size two, we have the option of building a settler. Do we want to build a settler as soon as we get the opportunity? The answer is generally no. The reason is um, building another city is quite resource intensive. First of all, while you're building a settler, your city will no longer grow. So London will be stunted in growth while we're building a settler. That's one thing. The second thing is every city uh, requires uh, additional happiness. It puts extra pressure on our cultural happiness. We'll talk more about happiness later on, but because of the difficulty setting we're on, currently we have 10 happiness. Every city you have and every unit of population you have will impact your happiness. Um, so until you've sec secured more happiness, you don't want to expand too much. Happiness can come from luxury resources, for example, pearls and silk. Once they are hooked up, because if once you get a plantation on silk or you get a work boat on pearls, then each one of these will give us plus four happiness, which is pretty nice. Note that, that you only get that once for each unique resource. So um, once we hook up the first pearls, we'll get plus four happiness, but the second pearls will not give us any additional happiness. So you might say, well, what's the point? Well, first of all, by improving the tile, we'll still get more gold out of that tile, which is good. But the extra pearls we have, we could trade to other civilizations for money or for different luxury resources, for example. So there's still not a lot of point. All that being said, the general rule of thumb that people use is they wait until their capital is somewhere between three and five population. And a lot of people wait until they've got about four people in their capital. At that point, you've that, and that's just sort of like sort of a yardstick. At that point, you usually have a good base of a few key technologies. You often have a worker out, which can be improving your tiles and securing your happiness and so on and so forth. But you can still do whatever you want. Now, at this point, we have to start on our next construction progress project. What do we do? At this early in the game, we don't need another warrior. Even on high difficulties, you don't need to worry about defense this quickly, so we don't have to do that. We could build a second scout, but I really don't think that's that important. And we can also build a monument. And culture is really good. We were talking about that. More culture means more tiles. More culture means faster social policies. But I'm still not going to take this quite yet, and I'll show you why. It is viable for you to pick a monument, but um, I'm plotting something very specific and so I'm going to ignore the monument. Instead, I'm going to get started on a worker. A worker is a non-combat unit that improves terrain. Um, and again, we need we need masonry before we can improve the stone. We need um, the calendar before we can improve silk. But our worker can still build farms. So we're going to get it started anyway. Actually, we're not even going to finish it, but spoiler alert, we're going to get back to that later on. Meanwhile, we have a unit that requires orders. Right now, it's the scout. So let's go ahead and move the scout, say north, just because I've already explored a fair chunk over here with my uh, warrior. So why don't we send our scout sort of north and then maybe west and wrap around over here. Ideally, I like to sort of make kind of a circle around my capital, get to know the area, as opposed to just running off in one direct direction and seeing how far I can go. I want to know what my surroundings are. Hmm, interesting. Um, I think I'll go up and follow the coast. I want to see, it looks like it 
Looks like the coast ends over here. I'm going to want to send my scout up there to see if I can find any more fish or pearls or um, there's a few whales maybe uh, off the coast. And so we'll know if we may want to put a city here later on. Again, I'm prompted. This button is your key every turn to tell you what you need to do. So we've got these runes. I'm going to make a beeline directly for it here. We'll get there in two turns. Hopefully no one will beat us to it. At this point, uh, we should be meeting some of our neighbors relatively soon. So we've got to be a bit on guard for that. So I'm going to move up one tile. Oh, there are some fish over here. And um, I like put going on the hills for extra vision, but it's sort of dead-endy. So I'm going to go this way. Oh, even more pearls. Wow, it's actually not a bad site for a city, potentially. Um, because, again, I told you that food is one of the most important things for a city. Fish give you extra food, so that's pretty good. And while pearls are mostly gold-related, the fishing boats will give you some extra food as well, so it's not bad. I'm going to go hit hit next turn. Oh! What happened here? Well, that's my warrior. I queued up the extra movement, so just now he finished his movement, landed on those ancient ruins, which gave me a crudely drawn map, which outlines the surrounding area. Now, to me, that's one of the weakest results you can get in a in an ancient ruin. Um, it is kind of handy that it does give you a little bit more vision, but I'd rather, you know, get more gold or maybe a free technology, for example. What's nice about the uh, the map, though, it actually did reveal where one of my opponents have their capital, Rio de Janeiro. I haven't met Brazil yet, but I actually know where their city is because of the map. This, that's actually, you don't see that very often, so it's kind of an interesting thing to have come up. Every game you play, of course, will be quite different. Let's go and officially meet um, Brazil over here. And to do that, you have to either sort of see one of their units or come up adjacent to their borders. So now I should get a screen. Hello, Pedro. Oh, nice to meet you. So, uh, so they give it a little greeting. They start off with a relationship. Right here, we're neutral because we've just met. There's not much to talk about. And we've got a few buttons to uh, do diplomacy with them. We could declare war right away, but there's no good reason to do that right now. We could try to trade, but this early in the game, no one really has anything to trade. We don't have any luxury resources or strategic resources. We can't open embassies until we have writing. We can't do open borders until we get civil service. We can't do research agreements until we get education and so on and so forth. Um, we could we could ask him to declare war on someone, but we haven't. Oh, now that's interesting. I did not realize that going to this declare war button actually reveals who the other civilizations in the game are. I've only been playing this game for like 100,000 years. Wow, that's really quite curious. So there's really nothing we can negotiate for right now. Uh, there's the demand. We could just for say, hey, listen, give me some money right now. Uh, on Frankly, on low difficulty settings, that may be completely viable, but it will make him hate you. Um, and we could also ask him for, you know, do we want to be mean? friends? He's not going to say yet. I'll, I'll ask. Shall we become friends? No, we haven't known each other long no, enough, so that won't happen. So for now, I'm just going to say goodbye. The, uh, the AI will come to you with deals from time to time. Um, but, you know, ideally you can go ahead and initiate them yourselves as well. So let's go to the west. Ooh, we've got some wheat over here. Very good source of food, especially if it happens to be next to a river. We'll see if that happens. Going to the north, we've got some furs and deer and a dashed border over here. This means there's a city-state up here. So we're going to go ahead and meet them next turn. Um, so my warrior over here, I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is move him east and then go up this coast. And again, just try to reveal, um, a little bit more territory, especially it'd be nice to see the, the tiles right around here, because I suspect we may end up colonizing a city right in this kind of area over here. It's got a lot of resources. Um, it's next to a river. Settling next to a river is quite nice because there's, um, a couple extra buildings that become possible if you're next to a river, for example, a water mill. Uh, furthermore, being having a city on a river gives you a bonus to trade, and trade becomes an important part of your economy later on. So let's move our scout up here and meet the city-state. Oh, we've met Brussels. This is, this is very appropriate. Uh, so we met the city-state of Brussels. City-states are not civilizations. They are not your opponents in the true sense of the word. They never expand. They never declare war on people, um, but what they are, they're like the pawns in this in this game. Actually, it doesn't make sense because pawns are always on the side, but they're people you can manipulate. You can uh, become friends with them. You can ally with them. Um, if they are allied to a civilization, then when that civilization goes to war, the city state will join in and you know send a few units. But most importantly, 
um, they give you a, a passive bonus if your friends are allied. So Brussels over here is what's called a cultural or cultured city-state. You can tell by the icon here, but also the fact that it tells you there. If we became friends with Brussels, they would give me bonus culture every turn. And that's pretty good. Furthermore, they have access to a luxury resource. They have access to furs. If we become allied with Brussels, well, first of all, by becoming allied as opposed to just friends, we would get even more culture. But furthermore, they would give us access to their furs, which is a luxury resource, which gives us happiness. First, also, just by meeting them, they give us some gold. So that's nice. So there we go. Now, I can walk into Brussels territory. One thing I should have mentioned, actually, when we were down to the south, and I can do that now. If I try to enter into Brazil's territory, I'll get a pop-up. The only way I'm allowed to enter their territory is if I want to declare war first. So I'm going to say no. Later on, we can negotiate open borders agreements, in which case I'll be able to walk through their land freely. And vice versa, if I, you know, if it's a bi-directional kind of deal. Um, I'm going to go up this way. But city-states don't follow the same rules. I can step my, my explorer into... The territory of Brussels without declaring war on them. And you can declare war on city-states if you want. Declare war right over here. Oh, I should talk about the screen. Um, but you don't have to to go in. So if I click on Brussels itself, I do get the screen. I get this information I got when I first met them. Um, but in, and in addition to a uh, relationship bar over here, you can see I'm totally neutral right now. I would need 30 influence with Brussels to become friendly. And then it doesn't tell you this right now, but you need 60 to become allied. The influence decays over time. You lose one point of influence on every turn uh, as a base rule. So you'd have to keep sort of sucking up to them. Uh, you can gain influence by completing quests. Right now, they have no quest for us, but they will give us quests later on. Additionally, we can give them gifts, generally gold. But we could also give them units if we wanted to, although you don't get a lot of influence from that at all. But you, generally, you can bribe these city-states, and that's often how you make friends with them. I can say that I'm going to be willing to protect them. So if I say this, if anyone goes and attacks Brussels, I, I have promised that I will say, go to war with their attacker. Now, this doesn't bind me to it, but it will upset Brussels if I don't go and defend them. Still, if I pledge to protect them, it will increase the influence um, that I have with them. Uh, it'll grow automatically over time. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So my influence will grow automatically up to level of five because I'm protecting them. It'll grow by one per turn and it'll stop at five. And likewise, if I go above that, if I go say 30 influence becomes friends, I'll still decay by one per turn, but it will stop at five. I could threaten them and ask for a tribute or I could declare war on them, which would allow me to actually conquer Brussels. But it's generally not a good idea. The Everyone in the game will hate you if you go around conquering city-states willy-nilly. Um, generally speaking, that's not a key part of the game. I, I almost never conquer city-states. There's virtually no need to do it because mostly they're not a threat. So you're going to want to throw your military might. If you want to conquer a city, why not conquer Rio, for example, which would actually eliminate one of my opponents from the game. Furthermore, uh, these cities tend to get a lot more awesome stuff like World Wonders. Anyway, let's move on to the next turn. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, what makest thou? So we've just discovered our first technology, which is pottery. We get a little bit of a quote. It reminds us what it unlocks and gives us a little bit of text over here. So we're going to hit continue. So a few things. First of all, we have to choose our next research uh, project here. Now, I am going to do what? It's an excellent question. I'm happy that you asked it. Honestly, this worker is going to be kind of silly right now because all he can do is build farms. We don't have the technology to build our quarries or our calendar or our plantation. So we may want to go in that direction. That's one possibility. In fact, I think that may be uh, what we do. Um, there's a couple of weirdness. First of all, this uh, silk here, uh, we won't actually be able to build a plantation here until we get the ability to chop down forests, which you get from mining. Um, mining also leads to masonry, masonry right over here, which is what we need to build our quarries. So I'm kind of tempted to go that way, but I don't think that's particularly strong. I think here's what I would like to do. I would like to see if maybe we have horses around here um, relatively quickly, especially if one of these tiles, I don't want to build a farm on one of these tiles and then just discover that there's horses there, then I have to take down the farm to build a pasture. That sounds kind of foolish. So let's go ahead and choose research. Let's go and pick up animal husbandry and see what we can see. I'm not going to say this is the strongest way to play things. 
actually might, might be stronger to go straight to sailing and start working the pearls, but I, I'm going to wait on that. We're going to see about grabbing animal husbandry and see what it might reveal to us. Furthermore, we don't really need this worker right away. Again, all you could do is build farms, which aren't bad. Why don't we wait until we actually get a technology that makes the workers more useful? I intentionally sort of line things up this way for a few reasons. One, there's a sort of min-max optimization thing going on, but it also gives me the opportunity to show that we can change our production. So if I click on my little worker here, I can bring up the production tab for London. Alternatively, what I could do is click on London and then click change production. Now, let's look at a little uh, icon over here. This worker, this yellow sort of ring around the worker picture shows our progress towards the construction. So we can, if we mouse over, it'll tell us it'll be built in 10 turns. It needs a total of 70 hammers to build a worker and we have put in 20 so far. We can also see that visually over here, this full yellow line is how much production we put in. This pale yellow is how much we'll be put in next turn. Now, if I change production, if I decide to build something else, that progress is not lost. So if I click change production and I say shrine. Now, now I'm building a shrine and the production has been reset. Okay, we're at 040 on the shrine. But if I switch back to the worker, you can see that there's still 20 hammers put into the worker progress. That has not been lost. Now, if I go and build a shrine, then a granary, then a monument, over time, I think that progress will decay, but you don't lose it right away. So that's okay. So I'm gonna go and build a shrine so that we can start to accumulate faith points. Faith points will allow us to form pantheons and later on religions. And it would be really cool to show that off. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in a shrine. Once the shrine is done, I will probably go back to finishing the worker, at which point maybe we'll have a technology that will help us there. We'll see how it goes. Meanwhile, our um, uh, scout is um, wants movement. Now, what happened to Brussels here? Do you notice how things have turned red? Brussels is currently angry. Why is it angry? Because we have a unit that ended its turn in their borders, they are getting angry with us. We will lose five influence every turn while that happens. So let's say I take my scout and I move it. I, you can't, I can't stop on Brussels itself. That would require a declaration of war. But I am allowed to move through Brussels to the other side. So I will once again end my turn in their borders. So they will get even more upset with me. So when you're exploring, you often want to avoid doing this. Sometimes it's worth it. And if you're at negative happiness, negative uh, influence, your influence will go up over time. Again, it has a resting point. Normally the resting point is zero. If you're above zero, it'll go down every turn. If you're below zero, it'll go up every turn. Our resting point is at five because we have promised to protect them. If you are friends with these guys or allied, but you know, as long as you're at least friends, then you can walk through their territory and they won't get mad. So I'm going to keep moving with my warrior here. You'll notice that these, this marsh over here would eat two units of movement. If I try to go over here, the game will automatically detect that, hey, maybe it's better if we move around this way. And you know what? I'm going to agree. Plus, also, I like ending my turn on hills for extra vision. Oh, we met Laventa. Laventa is a religious city-state. Um, two things. First of all, when you meet them, they actually give you a little bit of faith, which is nice and helps you found religions. And if you become friendly with them, they give you more faith per turn as well, which is great if you want to play a re religious game. Also, they have access to sugar, um, which means if we become allied with them, they will give me some sugar. That's the sugar right over here. Their, their borders will quickly grow to encompass that sugar, and they'll have that. Notice we get a little bit of an alert here, reminding us that we are trespassing in the lands of Brussels, and maybe we shouldn't do that, and also that we met Laventa end the turn. You can see Brussels is getting more and more cranky with us. So with that lesson in mind, let's go ahead and skirt around Leventa so that we don't upset them. And meanwhile, we're going to try to leave the Brussels territory. We're going to have to spend one more turn in their borders and upset them even further, unfortunately. But, you know, that's life. Oh, and we just met someone. Theodora of Byzantium. So if we go and close this, we can see why we met them. It's because we met a, whoops, a Byzantine warrior over here. Our scout and our warrior, they saw each other, which is all we need for the introduction. Now, if ever I want to talk to those people again, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. First of all, if I can see their city, like Rio over here, I can always click on Rio, and that will open up a diplomacy all screen right. here with Pedro. But I can't see any Byzantine cities, so how do I start diplomacy with her? with Theodora. Well, there's a diplomacy button over here in the top right corner. We'll talk about these other buttons soon enough, but this diplomacy button will show me everyone I've met and you can click on someone's name 
and open up a discussion. Melima. Hello. We're going to pop that down over there. Okay. Unit needs orders. Our scout can finally leave the uh, territory of Brussels. And we have met, or we have discovered our first natural wonder. We've discovered Mount Kalosh. Now, discovering a natural wonder by itself gives us an extra point of happiness empire-wide, empire which is really handy. If you were watching up here, my happiness had dropped to nine at some point because of my population, but because we met a nat, or we discovered a natural wonder, it's back up to 10, which is great. You'll also notice that it is a very special tile. Let's, let's see what this does in a second here. If I go down, toggle my map options and show the yield icons, you can see most, um, most territory gives you either food or production or gold, or a little bit of everything, right? Natural wonders do really weird stuff. Mount Kalosh over here has got a giant faith icon because it produces six faith. It doesn't produce any food or production or gold. It only produces faith. It also has a very special output of two points of happiness, which is really weird. And if I recall correctly, you don't actually have to work Mount Kalosh directly with population to get the happiness. I think as long as it's within your borders, you get it, if, if I'm not mistaken there. Um, but natural wonders give you like crazy cool stuff. We might want to settle a city near there. Let's keep moving our scout and see if we might uh, discover a great little territory. In any case, this video is uh, has reached its end. So we have upset Brussels, but they'll get back. We're still scouting around trying to find a good place for our city. And uh, we'll have to continue that next time. See you, folks. Bye-bye.